Okay. So today I'm going to talk to you um, about a project that I've started. I mean, I guess I haven't seriously been working on this um, probably about six months or so. So all of this is kind of new to me and some of it is more rough than others, but I'll work through it um, with you and see how we go. So I'd like to begin by um, thinking about a series of examples of the internet ceasing to exist in a sense, um, which I understand is when governments shut down internet access in times of political uprisings, revolutions, and revolts, and people cannot access internet infrastructure. So for instance, take the Saffron Revolution in Myanmar in 2007 when internet access was blocked by state officials. Again, in Egypt during the Arab Spring uprisings of 2011, then President Hansi Mubarak and the Egyptian government terminated access to the internet, what became known as flipping the internet kill switch. In Istanbul in 2014, in the aftermath of the Gezi protests, Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan bans access to Twitter in an attempt to prevent a corruption scandal due to incriminating material leaked to the social, ne social media network. So notably, these instances of internet shutdowns have been accompanied by similar actions in Iraq and Nepal, and North Korean citizens have little to no access to the internet. Instead, they use a domestic-only network called Kwang Myong. And additionally, site filtering and censorship regularly occurs in China and many European countries like the United Kingdom. And in the US, where I'm from, the internet might not be shut down, but has instead become a refined crystallization and extension of an extremist surveillance state. So my initial question with this Contra Internet project is, what do these events tell us about our historical present? Where are we now with what we call the internet? So perhaps an initial observation is that, unlike the media theorist Marshall McLuhan's insistence on media, as an extension of man, the internet, which one would think is a perfect example of such extensions, has now become more like extensions of governance. So notably, during the same time period as increased internet shutdowns and disconnections, two concepts have gained popularity in thinking and conceptualizing our present era of digital networks. And these concepts are the post-digital and the post-internet. And these two ideas, which are highly contested, but I'm not gonna get into that today. At the root of these ideas, they gesture toward marking the historical present as that which exists within a totalized sphere of the digital and the internet. So the digital is everywhere, the internet is everywhere, whether something is actually digital or not, whether or not something is online or not. And a popular term, another popular term in the arts um, that's an index of these ideas is simply post-internet art. And post-internet art has gained a lot of traction lately in the contemporary art world. And uh, given these uh, definitions I've briefly sketched of post-internet and post-digital, the term post-internet art should, in theory, account for a wide variety of, of artwork made all over the world today, but in fact, it actually accounts for a rather homogeneous uh, Western-centric clique. Um, usually the work is formalist, devoid of politics, and often produced by hipster artists. And this is also a crucial moment. Uh, Post-internet art signals a crucial moment in the arts because this is a moment where media art, what has been known as media art, has really dramatically crossed over into the contemporary art world. And this has been, um, this is kind of highlighted by a move toward object production, right? So away from that early era of net art, which was right, a, um, a critical relation to object production in the market, and now post-internet art as a happy subsumption into the contemporary art market. So um, some examples of this work before I move on, we have the Photoshop formalism of Artie Verkant, or we have the work of Katya Novitskova, who instrumentalizes the internet as a Cartesian grid that mutates all earthly materiality. So notably, post-internet art, the post-digital, and the post-internet are um, larger conditions of what we could call a contemporary theoretical postal malaise in the sense that all of these ideas are symptoms of this, right? And this is what the great feminist theorist Donna Haraway once described as going postal. 
And I would like to suggest that this obsession with the post signals an inability to think the historical present in its singularity. So, you know, if you look at this list here, you know, what has become, what is the mode of production? Well, the mode of production is post-Fordism. What's happened to post-politics, or what's happened to politics is post-politics. What's happened to media and the internet and the digital right, all post. Same with identity, right? We're now post-race, post-feminist, post-queer, et cetera. And at an event at the New Museum in New York this year, I even heard the term post-critical. So whatever that means, you can figure it out. And notably, so these terms, in a sense, become bottlenecks that all life, culture, politics must pass through. So, um, you know, kind of right off the bat, problematically, they collapse the potentiality of networks into this idea of the internet. So here are two questions. What if the internet is turned off and life, culture, politics, whatever, cannot pass through? Or what if life, culture, politics does not want to pass through those bottlenecks? What if they refuse? So out of this uh, theoretical vortex of postalisms, a contemporary definition of the internet emerges. And it's a definition that far exceeds its technical infrastructure and more like ascending as a totalized cultural or social condition. So in short, just as capitalism has been theorized in the past, the internet has come to stand as something of a totality, right? A kind of substitution, a puppet, a name for a much larger sociocultural condition today. So, but have the trajectories of the internet and the world truly collided as one and the same? Or perhaps the internet is already dead, dead from too many flips of the kill switch. But of course, there are indeed actions and events that fracture this assumed totality of the internet, and they are both the government shutdowns and the militant refusals. So today, my goal is to move this idea of the internet through a series of discursive transformations in order to locate the potentialities of a militant alternative or outside to the totality the internet has seemed to become. And I work, I do this uh, explicitly from a queer and feminist framework because I'm very committed in bridging those politics with um, an engagement with networks in the internet today. So um, the first transformation I'd like to talk about might resonate with um, one of the earlier talks. And um, this is thinking the idea of post-internet through the post-capitalist politics of the feminist philosophers, J.K. Gibson Graham, two women that wrote as um, a singular unit. And they came up with the idea of post-capitalism in the 1990s, right? And so um, their idea of post-capitalism is not an after to the totality of capitalism, but rather the, the economic alternatives at play within the supposedly right, totalized field of capital. So if you were to take the idea of internet, the post-internet, and kind of funnel it through this idea, which would be to obviously read post-internet against itself, you would arrive at something like the network alternatives at play today against the supposedly totalized field or frame of the internet. And these ideas of post-internet filtered through po the post-capitalist politics of J.K. Gibson Graham might be something like autonomous mesh networks, various cryptographic practices. So this move um, that J.K. Gibson Graham make to post-capitalists, they um, insist as a move from totality to one of possibility. And they come up with this term, capitalocentric, to signal right, an inability to think beyond or outside of capitalism as a totality. So perhaps we can take a hint or learn something from J.K. Gibson Graham, right, and develop this term internetocentric as an inability to think beyond or outside of the internet. So the second transformation is the move from post to contra. And the move from post to contra is a militant one. And this is adapted from the writings of Paul Preciado. Right? And in Paul Preciado's writings on contrasexuality, Contrasexuality is articulated as a refusal of sexual norms and naturalizations, and also the perverse constitutions of what Preciado calls 
contra pleasures in the body, but also contra sexuality evokes a, uto a utopian horizon of political transformation. So there's both this insistence on a certain refusal of norms and naturalizations, but also um, an experimental practice that's moving towards some kind of utopian horizon. So if we move from contrasexuality to the contra-internet, a tentative definition of contra-internet might be refusals of the internet and constitutions of network alternatives through things like subversion, transgression, and inversion. So Preciado does this through uh, what he calls dildo tectonics. And for Preciado, dildo tectonics is the prized science of contrasexuality. So the dildo here is an externality, um, external from the body, that undoes assumptions about the body as a totalized heterosexual unity. And so for Preciado, as you see in this amazing diagram here, the body can be mapped out entirely as a dildo. So for Preciado, this means the body can be transformed into pure contrasexuality. So an important note here for Preciado, the dildo is not the same thing as and cannot be reduced to a phallus. So as Preciado says, a penis is a meat dildo, but the dildo is not a plastic penis. So uh, Preciado develops a set of what he calls dildotopia exercises to practically experiment and get in touch with your own contrasexuality. And this is one of my favorites, which involves drawing a dildo on your arm and masturbating it. So I had the pleasure of actually doing this with a group of people multiple times around the world. And the first time was in Istanbul last year. And so we participated um, in this exercise that Preciado outlines. I guess you could say um, Preciado's activity is uh, it's kind of framed as individual, but we did it as a group. So it was kind of a contrasexual masturbatory orgy, I guess. And this act was to lead to the question, what are the dildo tectonics of the internet? So for me, an initial way to answer this is to always kind of tease apart the assumptions that network and internet equate the same thing, right? So the internet may be comprised of networks, but a network is not necessarily the internet. But perhaps we could even go further, you know, in the line of Preciado choosing the form of the dildo to articulate contrasexuality. Um, Perhaps we can imagine a networking that goes actually beyond the form of the network itself. This is what Ulysses Mijeas has called the paranode. And the paranode is this idea of the space unaccounted for by the standard network diagram of nodes and edges. So all the space that the network diagram can't account for just through um, diagramming connections based on nodes and edges. OK. so. Again, kind of following in the line of Preciado, um, from dildo tectonics, I go to the really clunky term, paranoid tectonics, and to try and kind of develop a set of playful, experimental exercises or activities to try and imagine and experiment with this idea of the contra internet. And the first one is um, this idea of utopian plagiarism, which actually, um, I wish I had thought of this, but this is a tactic critical art ensemble uh, first wrote about in the early 90s. And um, I'll show you a quick clip of a video of me kind of experimenting with this using the work of J.K. Gibson, Graham Preciado, and the band La Tigra and some others. Oh, the sound is not on.
So I, I forgot to tell you all in advance, sorry, the resolution wasn't worked out, so I guess that's kind of confusing to look at. But um, I won't play the whole video, and this was uh, made into a book called The End of the Internet As We Knew It, and you'll just see a little excerpt here. Understanding internet has always been a project of the left, especially within the Marxian tradition. There, where knowledges of internet arguably originated, theories accorded an explicit social role. From Marx to Lenin to the neo-Marxists of the post-network war II period, theorists have understood their work as contributing, whether approximately or distantly, to counter-internet projects of political action. In this sense network theory has related to politics as a subordinate of the servant, we understand the network in order to change it. Given the avowed servitude of left theory to left political action, it is ironic, though not surprising, that understandings and images of internet can quite readily be viewed as contributing to a crisis in left politics. So to give you some context for this, since you didn't see that whole video, um, in that video, certain words from the text of J.K. Gibson, Graham, Friedrich Jameson, uh, Preciado, et cetera, are uh, replaced. So every time the word capitalism appears, it's substituted with internet. Every time the words economic and world appear, they're substituted with network. And it's kind of a formula that's followed throughout all of those texts and then compiled as a book. And if I wouldn't have been so jet lag, I would have brought a copy to show you from London. Okay, so next paranoid tectonic is this idea of uh, social media exodus. So social media exodus um, is a withdrawal from, well, from corporate monoculture. So importantly, right, uh, this idea of social media exodus is not some kind of privileged gesture, but it's one that refuses the neoliberalization of networked relationality. So social media exodus would be a retraining of our subjectivity, away from the brute reduction of friendship to the tweet, the like, the friend request, the icon or the avatar, and as well, um, resisting and refusing against the co-optation of such networks by governments and various surveillance agents. So a social media exodus could lead us to a needed disidentification with these very networks, to not recognize oneself in these networks. I'm not gonna show you the whole thing. Um, so this idea of social media exodus, uh, it's also about an idea of political subjectivity, right? So political subjectivity could be said to emerge precisely when the subject does not recognize itself in its representation. It is fundamental not to recognize oneself. Derecognition, disidentification is a condition for the emergence of the political as the possibility of transforming reality a kind of experimentation that doesn't have faith in representation as an exteriority that will bring truth or happiness. So I would like to end on this idea of the network militant, which is thinking about a different kind of example of the internet ceasing to exist. So the example here takes place in Hong Kong in 2014 during the pro-democracy protests when protesters there began utilizing FireChat, which is a mesh networking device for smartphones, so you basically need uh, to have at least Bluetooth capabilities, and it enabled protesters to share information and connect 
without having a cell phone uh, network signal or Wi-Fi. Um, and this was done due to fears of Chinese government possibly surveilling or cutting out the internet. So what um, to me is kind of remarkable in, as with this example, which is not isolated, is that uh, protesters were able to digitally network without the internet. So right, um, other examples of this um, have taken place all around the world. Um, mesh networking for political reasons has occurred in New York during Occupy, Detroit for economic reasons, Taiwan, Iraq, and they illustrate a kind of network militancy. Right? They uh, at once highlight the inadequacies of the internet, but they also give us a utopian glimmer of another kind of network. And they present to us, perhaps quite stunningly, the end of the internet as we knew it. But kind of as an afterthought here, we must remember, contrary to this idea of the network militant, that in our dreams, we have also seen a form beyond the network, an honest form, a form decidedly more fair than the one in which we now live. Thank you.